Hi there. So we are on chapter four. That chapter covers psychological assessment, diagnosis and treatment. Again, I'll just cover a few topics in a little bit more depth. So I want to begin by calling your attention to a very important book, and you will see that book being referred to in the different chapters that are following this particular chapter, okay? It's called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Psychological Disorders, also goes by DSM. The latest edition is the fifth edition, so it's referred to as DSM-5, and it contains all the psychological disorders that a mental health professional, such as a psychiatrist, a psychologist, marriage and family counselor, licensed professional counselor, etc., that those professionals can diagnose. Okay, it is the most commonly used diagnostic system in the United States. I would like to share with you briefly what a psychological evaluation or assessment can look like. Some psychological assessments are fairly quick and short, maybe lasting 30 to 40 minutes. And it's basically a meeting in which the mental health providers collect as much information as they find important and relevant in determining whether a person they're speaking with merits the diagnosis of a mental illness. Some psychological assessments can last hours and include many different components. So I'd like to just outline a few of such components that are typically used or, or incorporated into a more comprehensive psychological evaluation. Pretty much every mental health professional begins their assessment with what we call the clinical interview. The clinical interview is basically a conversation that the mental health professional has with the client in which they ask a lot of questions about the symptoms, the struggles, the past history, mental not only of mental health issues, but also physical health issues, um, family history, developmental history, etc. And for some evaluations, that's really all there is to it. If we're talking about a more comprehensive evaluation that you will find additional components. For example, many professionals use what we call, you know, psychological inventories, okay, or personality inventories. Those are tests such as the MMPI, uh, which is very much described in a good amount of detail in the textbook, so I'm not going to go into the detail. Another example is the PAI, or the Personality Assessment Inventory, which has over 300 questions, and they ask a broad range of inquiries about the different types of symptoms that people can have uh, under different diagnoses. Those tests are time-consuming and long, okay? Um, but there are tests that are also very useful, but short. Um, those are response inventories, such as the Beck depression inventory or the Beck anxiety uh, inventory that ask a lot of questions that are specific to a certain category of disorders. They can take you know, anywhere between five and 10 minutes to complete. And sometimes actually um, the provider will use them again in the future to see how much the symptoms may have changed as a result of treatment. There is also a category of tests called projective tests, which tend to be more subjective. Some providers don't like to use them because they consider them uh, not sufficiently valid or reliable. Uh, they are tests that were designed with the intention of tapping into the person's unconscious through indirect ways. Okay, so there is the Rorschach ink block test, for example, or the sentence completion test. A sentence completion test is a test where there's a, a fragment of a sentence and the person needs to complete it with whatever comes to mind. And the idea here is that whatever comes to mind might actually reveal some information about the person's unconscious. Okay, uh, those are typically used together with the other tests, such as the inventories. Um, 
but again some providers just don't use them but they can be useful if they are used in conjunction with many other things finally i would like to mention uh, briefly cognitive assessments those would be assessments that are designed to measure the cognitive abilities both in children or adults uh, what would be the types of situations in which you would use a cognitive assessment tool, such as uh, the Wexler scale of intelligence? It would be in cases, let's say, in which you are trying to determine whether a child has a neurodevelopmental disorder, such as autism spectrum disorder, or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or some kind of um, learning disability. Uh, those would be the tests that a lot of providers use uh, to help them make that kind of diagnosis. They're used with adults as well, again, for a variety of different disorders, not only cognitive decline concerns or concerns about cognitive functioning per se, but they may be used, let's say, for an adult who is coming in for an evaluation of autism spectrum disorder or ADHD or even a learning disorder. It turns out that the tests of cognitive functioning tend to be uh, most rigorous um, when it comes to uh, reliability and validity, and they have also typically been standardized on large samples of people, uh, so they tend to be highly regarded in, in the community of, of psychological providers for those reasons. They also have limitations, uh, but we'll not, we'll not get into those here. Well, thank you for your attention and I will see you next time. Bye-bye.